In this video, I'm going to show you how to do a factor analysis in Smart PLS 3. So what you need to do is set up your model like we've done in previous videos and go to calculate. And we're actually going to run both. Um, we're going to run a PLS algorithm and we're going to run a bootstrapping. Um, let's start with the PLS algorithm. And in the options here, um, I would like to <clears throat> connect all of the latent variables for initial calculation. They are already connected, so this isn't a problem. But if yours weren't, this is one way to do it. Um, and then I want to use the, the factor uh, weighting scheme in this approach. And that's really all I need to check uh, or change. When I'm done, I'm actually just going to close this. Um, well, when I'm done, I'm going to close this instead of looking at the report. Um, because I'm just going to run a bootstrapping uh, after that. So let's start the calculation. And it runs. And you, you know it ran if numbers appear here. And then I'm just going to run a bootstrapping on top of this. Consistent bootstrapping. The options, um, I'm not going to change them from what I had before, which was a 1,000 subsamples um, and parallel processing. So it goes faster. Um, and that's all I'm going to change. I believe. Let me just double check here. Yep, using factor still. Uh, that looks good. And we're good. Start calculation. And it's going to run. There we go. Numbers pop up. We know it worked. So what we want to do, uh, this time we're going to focus on the outer model here. Um, the, the loadings. And in this case, I have all reflective factors. Uh, maybe I should do one in just a minute with formative. But in this case, with the reflective, let's take a look. Now, if you want to just eyeball it, let me zoom in here. You can eyeball and say, hey, look, uh, all of these T statistics are above 1.96. Therefore, uh, these are significant indicators. Uh, you can look at all these. It's the same story. And over here, the same. So we can say, hey, all these are good indicators. Um, we can also look instead at the actual report. So um, over here on the left, next to the indicators tab, you'll see another tab called calculation results. Uh, this only shows up if your active tab is your project tab where your model is. If you have another report open and that's the active tab, then this tab right here, calculation results, won't show up. So what I want is I want to look at first, um, not the bootstrapping, but the PLS algorithm and click on report that's going to open this report and the default page is these path coefficients um, right now i'm not interested in those i'm interested in some of the stuff down here first of all um, i want to look at those outer loadings now notice there's also outer weights here let me let me show you essentially you come up with a pattern matrix here for loadings if we had formative variables i would click on weights and it would switch over to the weights but we'll talk about that later so go back to outer loadings and we can see this is like a pattern matrix and it, in in this pattern matrix it's going to flag anything that has a weight um a weight they say weight loading <laughs> has a loading uh, less than 0.7. That doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's less than 0.7. Um, now, this one here, number 12, that's kind of low, 0 0.277. Uh, I'd begin worrying about that one a little bit. We can go look at its Cronbach's alpha to see if that is um, too low and it's bringing down the alpha. Uh, either way, I'd probably remove it. That's, that's a pretty low loading. We go over here to innovativeness, and everything looks pretty good. It's all above 0.5. Um, I would keep everything there. Skill acquisition. I only had three items. Um, is that right? Only th No, here we go. There are five items, uh, ending with seven. And they all look good, except maybe this first one. That's a pretty low loading, less than 0.4. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, first, I'm going to go look at the Cronbox Alpha, or the Composite Reliability and uh, see if we have any issues there. Also look at the AVE um, and see if it needs to be brought up. So here we go. Construct reliability and validity. What this is, is the Crimex Alpha, the composite reliability, and the AVE. Notice the AVE for CSE and skill acquisition are not what they should be. Um, they should be above 0.5. So uh, the composite reliability is fine. We're not worried about that. 
but it looks like we do need to do some work on um, these two. So even before I go look at the bootstrapping report, I'm gonna just go fix that model. So let's really quick review which ones we need to get rid of. I believe it was efficacy 12 and um, skill one. Okay, so let's do that. Go back to our model and effic uh, see skill one, you can see that loading 0.383. Um, I'm going to just hit delete and efficacy 12 here you are I'm going to hit delete and then I'm going to run this again notice the reports are gone and it's because we changed our model so go run it again PLS algorithm and in fact I'm not going to do the bootstrapping yet I'm just gonna do this uh, to see what it comes up with and if, if we fixed what we needed we could go back to loadings and see if the loadings are better. They do look better, and they look better. Let's go look at the reliability and validity. Uh, the AVE is still not where it needs to be. Now, there are papers um, that say the AVE is a pretty strict uh, measure of reliability and convergent validity, um, and that you can rely on composite reliability by itself. Um, but let's see if we can help this out just a little bit. So let's go back to the outer loadings and see which items are really dragging us down. Um, here we go. Efficacy 3 is also below 0.5. That's troublesome. And I don't know if I want to change anything on skill acquisition. I might just deal with it. Um, maybe I'll try skill acquisition 3, but that's it. I'm not going less than 3 items. So skill act 3 and efficacy 3. Well, that's easy to remember. So. Skill Act 3, deleted, and Efficacy 3, deleted. Last time I'm doing this, run, consistent, run, and these numbers, I bet it's not going to be any better, honestly. Uh, 0.5s aren't what I was hoping for here. Um, and down here, yeah, same issue, I doubt we're going to be any better. So. It might have been better for us to just leave those items in. But let's look at the report. Go look at reliability and validity. Yep, still a problem. In fact, uh, skill acquisition got worse uh, in all respects. So I'm going to bring skill acquisition um, 3 back in. And then we'll go to the um, bootstrapping. So how do we do that? Go back to indicators. Here's skill acquisition 3. I'm going to pull it right back into this. There we go. It cleans it up. Um, and let's get our final uh, statistics here. Go to the report and discriminant or convergent validity. So here are the numbers we'd report. We'd say the composite reliability is fine. Um, and even though the AVE is low, we, we do have composite reliability as an indication of convergent validity. Um, and then we could go to discriminant validity next down here. And what we have here is on um, the off diagonal, we have the correlations of the constructs. So CSE correlates with innovativeness at 0.524. And on the diagonal, we have the square root of the AVE. Now, the Fornell-Larker criterion is that the square root of the AVE must be greater than any of those interfactor correlations. So uh, it looks like we're good. Uh, the lowest one we have here is 659, and it is greater than any of those correlations. 702 is greater than those correlations, and 717, of course, is greater than those correlations. So we're good. Now, there's a new one that I really like. It's the heterotrait monotrait um, criteria. And this is a measure of discriminant validity that says essentially um, whether these are the same or different latent factors. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the algorithm and the measure, but the threshold that you're looking for is 1. If the values are less than 1, then that indicates that these are different factors. Notice um, the lower they are, the more different they are. So we would say in this case we do have discriminant validity because, of our, because our HTMT values are all less than 1. So that's an excellent additional um, measure for discriminant validity. The last thing we want to do uh, for our factor analysis here is to look at model fit down here, model fit. And if we scroll up here, uh, if you look at the SRMR for 
the, ooh, actually, I'm going to do this in the bootstrapped model. So ignore this for now. Uh, we want it less than 0.08. It looks like we have it at less than 0.08, so that's good. Um, but let's go ahead and run this uh, through a bootstrap. Here we go, consistent bootstrapping, and start, and wait for it. All right, it ran. Let's go to the report. And there are a few more things we can look at here. Um, again, let's see, we could look at the AVEs. These are after the bootstrap, so they are more accurate. Um, and you look at the sample mean, and it looks like we still have issues here um, with a 0.49 and 0.435. Um, so still, still less than desired. Um, if we were to produce a t-statistic for them though, uh, they are significant. So that is maybe meaningful. Um, we can look at the composite reliability as well. And we can see that that CR um, is good for everything. Scale acquisition is close to the 0.7 uh, border, but it is above. And those are significant and just phenomenal t-statistics there. Um, Cronbex Alpha is also available. Same with the heterotrait, monotrait as before. SRMR I'm going to look at for model fit and notice uh, for the sample mean the one that was bootstrapped our SRMR is substantially lower uh, definitely less than 0.08 which is what we're looking for it is significant meaning we do have uh, good fit essentially um, and so our model is good is there anything else down here I want to include I think that's good for now for the factor analysis so there you have it. That's how you do a factor analysis, uh, at least with all reflective variables. Uh, let me just show you real quick, I suppose, uh, how to do it with a um, formative measure, or at least where to look at or what it'll look like. If I were to right click on this uh, variable and set these indicators um, to be formative. Notice here, it says switch between formative and reflective. So I'm gonna switch, notice what happens is the arrows now point at skill acquisition. I'll zoom out, run this model through a bootstrap. Um, actually, no, I'm gonna run it through just the regular PLS algorithm here and start. And notice these values change drastically. Um, they are now uh, not showing loadings, they're showing weights, which are different. Um, and if I were to go to the report, I would look at, for that factor, I would look at outer weights, not loadings. And um, where's skill? Here they are. Here are those weights. And essentially what I want to do is have uh, roughly equal weights. Um, they don't have to be equal, but roughly equal is, is helpful. And when I run the bootstrap, I want all of these weights to be um, significant. So let me run this, and hopefully we'll get a set of significant bootstrap weights. Here are those T statistics. Remember before we had uh, skill acquisition three was possibly a low loading. Well, it's also a low weight um, and is not significant at the 95% confidence level on a two-tailed test. Um, so those are those T statistics, and if you want to see their p-values, go to the report. Here they are. Um, oop, not here. Excuse me. And zoom out. Go down to outer weights, and zoom back in. It was skill acquisition three. Notice that weight is not significant. Uh, these are the p-values here, but the others are. So there you have it. That's how you would do it for a formative factor. In my next video, I'll do something else.